All right, give me a couple takeaways, Caleb. Coop here, uh, first down. All right. All right, so, um, I'll, you know, since it's two, I want to do, like, the two that we that are just too obvious that we don't have to talk about and flesh out too much. So um, penalties were horrendous for both teams. Um, Alabama 15 for 115 yards, but Tennessee 11 for 95. You can't have that many penalties at home, and most of them were good calls. I'm sorry, guys, they were. And also um, – I Turnovers. thought, though, as a whole, the officiating was horrible. I thought there was a bad spot. I thought James Pierce was off sides. I'm about I to just... get to that. Okay. So save right, my takeaway. I just thought they were too intrusive in the game for me. I mean, that's just a lot of penalties. I'm going to get to that, but Tennessee fans may not like what I say on that. But I am going to say first, line, um, uh, penalties were horrendous for both teams. And turnovers, Tennessee kept Alabama in it because they had three turnovers. Um, yes, Alabama had that interception at the end, but up until that, Tennessee had three turnovers to Alabama's just one because Tennessee did almost outgain them by 100 yards. So kind of basic stuff, penalties and turnovers, you don't want to have. Okay, what do you got next? Those are my. Those are two I need, I need to uh, Okay, down. all right, next down, Coop. Oh, Cooper Mays here, second down. Go, what do you got? All right, I'm, I'm sticking with the negative for a minute, guys, but um, the officiating was really skewed towards Tennessee in this game. Tennessee benefited way more, benefited way more from Alabama in this game, and I know you're talking about the bad spot with Jalen Milrow. That was a terrible spot, but then there was. You're right. James Pierce was clearly offside. Ricky Gibson got away with a clear, the most clear as day holding penalty I think I've ever seen. On the driver, Alabama had to settle for a field goal. You know the one I'm talking about, Dave. Yes. Um, and then uh, the where, uh, that where the Alabama player faked an injury. And the refs accidentally called offsides on that. Look, you can hate faking injuries all the time. That's no. allowed. That's not an offside penalty. Well, they and... call it illegal substitution. Uh, yeah, illegal did. substitution. Excuse me. That's not yeah. illegal substitution. You're right. But I swear that was kind of like, I'm so frustrated by this stuff. I can't take it anymore. Like the yeah, officials but... on the spot were like that. Uh, but, it just, wait, there's... You're right. It's the wrong call, and there's not a rule. Elias, thank you for the super chat. To they young just tried to, they tried to punish Kalen DeBoer for taking advantage of a rule they don't like. You can't do that as the as the officials. That's not your job. And then the last one, I'm sorry, but um, uh, Boo Carter should have been flagged for a personal. It should have been an offsetting penalty on that fourth and twenty two. It should have been yes. fourth and twenty two. That should have been an offsetting penalty. That's very much. Dallas Baker, Jonathan Wade, Tennessee, Florida, way back in 2004. Okay, yes. you got you have to you have to offset those penalties. Um, I, the rest were horrible for and, and, and game no bueno is right. The rest made up for last year when they basically gave the game to Alabama late. This time, guys, I, I don't. I'm not saying they gave the game to Tennessee, but man, the officiating was skewed towards Tennessee in this game. Yeah, I I just thought it was bad as a whole. I mean, how many penalties did they end up having? Um, or did they did the officials end up calling? It was over 16, wasn't it? I mean, I just I don't I mean, there's no way the game was that poorly played. Um I think it might have been actually. This was an ugly football game, guys. This it is was the, an ugly football this game. is I haven't seen a Tennessee Alabama game this ugly since uh man, I sound like how am I the youngest one and I sound like the old guy? I haven't seen this back since this day and age, and I do that all the time on the show, but I haven't seen a Tennessee Alabama game this ugly since the 2005 six to three game. Where uh, Mike? Oh, Stewart. I was gonna go back further. The nine to six game. That oh, 1990. I was barely old enough to remember that. I remember be, that my I remember my parents couldn't find a sitter, so I was at a at a party, um, an adult party, which is weird for like a. 14 oh my gosh! Old. Wait, I want to do this adult party. <laughs> adult parties for hookers, baby. Let's go! Let's go! <laughs> uh, twenty eight penalties all together. Is that right, Kyle? Uh, I think it was twenty five. Uh, no, twenty six. Twenty six penalties all together. But yeah, I, 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 but no, I think it was, look, it was ugly since ugly since I, I'll. You're right. The nineteen ninety, but the two thousand five game was super ugly. That was a. Uh, Remember Lucas Taylor getting on his knees to field a punt and fumbling it? And yes. then and then uh, Corey Anderson. Fumb- I mean, Randy Sanders with probably the greatest play call of his life on a screen pass to Corey Anderson that should go for a touchdown, but Corey Anderson fumbles it out of the back of the end zone. Yeah, that kid was falling after that game. I felt so sorry for him. You know, he was a local AE kid, went to Austin a- East, um, had overcome a lot. That's, that's one of those where – Given the backstory, yeah, I wanted to cry with him. That was just oh, awful. That's, um, yeah. After seeing Kalen DeBoer up close, the poll question is, what do you think? Great hire for the Vols. Uh, still a good <laughs> coach with a new team. I think it's a great hire for the Vols. I saw some – listen, I've, I, I've been as critical of Josh Heupel as anybody. 
at times because I don't think he's adjusted and played this 12 personnel enough and relied on running the football, Caleb. And I disagree a little bit on that, but nevertheless, that's where I stand. I still will say this. Josh Heupel has never looked lost on the sidelines like Billy Napier did last week and Kalen DeBoer did this week. I think you have to be fair. Um, and I'm going to be fair. I watched this game. And the more This was more about Jalen Milrow playing bad football. I can't, I can't put Kalen DeBoer and Billy Napier in the same sentence. I thought Kalen DeBoer kind of knew what he was doing. I just think he's got a quarterback that's not a fit for what he wants to run. Billy Napier lost that game for Florida last week. I went back and watched it again, Dave, and I, I, I got to be honest. There's no reason Tennessee should have won that game. They they won it because Billy Napier coached it away. I think I don't think Kalen DeBoer coached this game away. I'm going to be honest. Um, do do, do me Tennessee a favor if you can. In the message board, I just want to hear this. Or click the thumbs up button either way. Because my guy Caleb Calhoun did a darn good job. when, And I agreed with him. I didn't argue with him. But I wanted to see what would happen. But he said in the offseason that he didn't think Jalen Milrow was a good fit for this offense. And we can discuss why if you want to now, but it's an offense that's more predicated on reading and being able to make plays and progressions. If that wasn't woefully obvious in the last seven and a half minutes of that football game, I don't know what was because I felt like there were times where Jalen Milrow dropped back and saw 28 defenders. And he didn't know where to go with the football. And given his athletic ability, why didn't he just roll out and run at times? I, I just, I'll tell you uh, why. I think I'll that's give credit obvious. To, I'll give credit to Tim Banks, but still, uh, to me, it was just an absolutely yeah, that's, play of quarterbacking by Jalen Milrow. At the end. It was terrible. I think Tim Banks knew what Jalen Milrow was. Did you notice there were moments where he had James Pierce and Joshua Josephson at the same time? Which yes. he doesn't usually do. Yes. That was because he wanted the athleticism on the outside. That totally took away Jalen Milrow's ability to run. That just completely – usually you have one, uh, one like kind of more power in on one side and an edge rusher on the other. He was putting two edge rushers out there. And, I mean, guys, go back and watch. It is one of the most brilliantly called defensive games I have ever watched in, in football. I want to and, credit Tennessee's defensive line, which is all about getting to the passer, right? Yeah. That's how they were built because they were supposed to be up – by 30 points well, at the end of the other You're just quarter. stealing my takeaways when you're asking me about them. Oh, sorry. But I thought their gap discipline was incredible. What down are we on in, in fourth downs? No, it's third. Downs? Huh? That was third? Third. This is third right. right now. Tennessee center Cooper Mays here. Third down. If you say gap discipline, then I'm sorry. I took that from you. No, you usually say gap integrity. I like that one better. But um, okay. going to that, the line of scrimmage play was the difference on both sides of the ball. Um, Tennessee, I mean, this it's old school SEC football. And when I say line of scrimmage play, Dave, I don't mean just the offensive versus defensive lines. I mean the defensive front seven versus the offensive lines and tight ends and running backs. Does that make sense? You know what I mean? Yes. Like, I mean the whole unit. Tennessee won that. Tennessee Tennessee won the ground and pound game. They did. Um, and I can just give you some stats. I don't, yes, Alabama did have one more sack, but Dave, here's a crazy stat for you that I don't know if you know. Outside of Alabama did have three sacks. You want to know, but they only had two hurries. Tennessee, guess how many hurries they had in the game? Mm, I would say 12. You nailed it. They had 12 hurries and also three sacks. So they their pass rush was better. On top of that, they just ran the ball better. Um, Dylan Sampson had, I mean, the team as a whole had over 200 rushing yards. That's a Josh Heupel offense. Alabama, Dave, had 34 carries for 75 yards. Uh, Jamarian Miller had just 12 carries for 42 yards. Justice Haynes, eight carries for twenty for 22 yards. Alabama couldn't run the ball. Tennessee could, and Tennessee really started to pick it up in the second half. And I tweeted, Nostradamus Caleb. I tweeted after the Dylan Sampson fumble on the first drive. You know what I tweeted, Dave? I don't know. I said, what did Nostradamus straight tweet? <laughs> did you just say Nostradamus? <laughs> Well played. Well played. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, I said, you heard it here first, more positive than negative for the Vols. That. Yeah, more positive than negative for Vols on that first drive, despite the Samson fumble. They added the stretch run play to counter the new defensive looks at them. It allowed a whole new element to their offense in this game. And did it add a whole new element to their offense? Yes, it did. Because the only reason Tennessee 
didn't score more the way they should have is they had turnovers in this game unlike the last few games. But they went for over 400 yards of offense, which is what they want to do in a game like this. And I think it was their stretch run plays. And they won the line of scrimmage. The interior of Tennessee's offensive line was elite one again, once again. And the tackles played a C game. And Dave, again, if I, I feel like we're regularly getting seeing A plus games from the interior of Tennessee's offensive line, just regularly. It's almost becoming expected. Oh, that's why. And maybe you disagree with it. That that's why I would so many times play to that strength. I would, I, I would, I would continue to play to that strength, and maybe to a fault, Caleb. I'd run the ball between the tackles a lot. I like what you said about the outside zone runs and things that we're doing and pulling people, and I thought that was great. But ultimately, it's kind of like uh, when you have steak and eggs the, for breakfast. The potatoes, those side potatoes, they're nice, but really, what are you there for? You're there for the steak and eggs. That's true, but you have to, you know, if the steak and you eggs have to get aren't your carbs in. You got to get your carbs in. And, and the outside runs are just to keep them honest. Because guess what? After those outside runs, Alabama couldn't – now, Alabama didn't run much of a 3-3-5 in this game anyway, to be fair. They weren't doing what other teams were doing against Tennessee. It's but... funny. Somebody said earlier this week, and I can't remember who it was, but it was a, a Tennessee player that said structurally they're really not like that. You can't just up and run a completely different defense. Just like, I mean, you recruit to your personnel so that, I mean, you can, like it was pointed out, two coaches in Sam Pittman and Billy Napier wanted to save their job. But if you do that at Alabama where you still have a college football playoff position to play for, it it feels like desperation leading into the Tennessee game. You see how Oh, it absolutely feels like desperation. I totally agree. And... I mean, you're right, and and you can't just throw that in. And that one of the great points you bring up is that, look, maybe they would do better against this three three five if they had more time to prepare for it. But throw the last two weeks out, guys. I'm telling you right now that Tennessee beat Alabama twenty one to seventeen, and Nico Meliava had a touchdown pass. Are you not happy? Are you not happy? I mean, it's are you not entertained? Yeah, and and, and I want to say this too, um, Dylan Sampson. Let's start having this conversation is the most impactful player that Tennessee has had since Al Wilson. Because when they absolutely, I'm sorry to interrupt, when they absolutely had to get some momentum and make it make a play, Al Wilson was there back in the day. Now it feels like they hand the ball to Dylan Sampson and the offense gets rolling somehow. You know what's crazy is Dylan Sampson doesn't play like an all-purpose back because all here's what all – Dylan Sampson is wearing teams down and being a workhorse back. He's getting his yards in the second half, and I didn't think I'd see this, but he's doing it. And Dylan Sampson today, for those who don't know, I think he got his 17th touchdown, which tied Reggie Cobb for second most all-time in Tennessee history. Guys, there's a whole month of football left to play. More than a whole month of football left to play. Tennessee's still got five games left on the, on the well, schedule. And remind people, for those that don't know who holds the record, how about Gene McEver? Gene McEver, yeah. Set that record in 1929. And I believe it was 18 touchdowns. And by the way, the only reason he set that record was because he had five touchdowns in the final game of the year against South Carolina. So, uh, guys, Dylan Sampson is really, really making a push for – I mean, we're talking about greatest running back seasons in Tennessee history. I I, Honestly, we're we're really on that. We're really talking about that now. I I really think it goes beyond that. I I think you have to start comparing him to – some of the all-time great single season performers at other positions such as quarterback such as i mentioned at middle linebacker i i, I, I think it's i think it's already beyond that and he's he's have, have you ever seen a running back that's a leader the way he is like i think that's what's so rare about him it's dylan sampson is actually a leader of this offense and a leader of this team and i mean guys i i'm owning all running backs that are bad leaders <laughs> i'm I not going to out them right now but there were a couple in that Kelly Washington team that we talked about that were far more problems than he was. But. I can believe that. But running backs, you don't expect to be there to be leaders. You expect them to just be good teammates and go about doing their business, typically. Um, Dylan Sampson is – like, for instance, Travis Henry in 2000. He went about doing his business. How He did it better than anybody. No one ran harder than Travis Henry, so I think people love him because he just – he went extremely hard on every play. Um And I know there's a bunch of jokes there because of his, you know, (laughs) all the kids he has. But he ran extremely hard. 
Uh, but he wasn't like you weren't going to look to Travis Henry to galvanize that team, were you? Ever? Not from a leadership standpoint. No. Not not stand in front of the room and say rally behind me. Where I think is Dylan Sampson has done that on several occasions, and I'm not just talking about games this season. I'm talking about in practices where maybe they were dogging it. Yeah, I agree. I think that this is, and I think Dylan Sampson's done that a lot, and I got to give him all the credit in the world. I guys, no one lit into him more than me. But you you guys just give me credit. What he was doing was he was listening to our podcast, and he was saying, "I'll show Caleb." Yes, um, actually, he tunes in live every day. He he got his class schedule moved so that he could be here at ten. Sometimes he has to leave practice early, but he's always a part of the program. All right, we got another down to get to. Brought to you by Campbell Cunningham, Taylor and Han. All SEC Center Cooper Mays here. Fourth down. All right, what's your final takeaway before we get to the turning point? And there were about eighteen, so good luck narrowing that down to one. Oh, it's easy for me. It's easy for me, and I'll get to that. But uh, it's Nico Imaliava's turn in the corner. And Dave's going to disagree with me. Dave, you can play uh, Tracy Morgan all you want for that, but Nico Imaliava has officially turned a corner, guys. That's the takeaway? That's or that's takeaway. the turning point, or both? That's my, t- that's my takeaway. That's my takeaway. Okay, I'm not going to say you're crazy. I think there's a chance that that's the case. But right now, I don't believe that – I don't believe his tough days are over. I think this is an improvement – I think this defense was uh, way overrated in the preseason. Um, Angie says, yes, both teams are horrible. Yeah, Angie, you're pretty much right. But I understand why one team looks horrible, and that's Tennessee because it's a young quarterback. And it's a group of receivers that, I'm sorry, to this point, even including tonight, have been overrated. <laughs> 